it's close to 17 years now. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll give you some things today. And hopefully you everything we talk about today, I hope that you've heard of. Hopefully it's just going to serve as a review for you. Now one of the things as we go throughout today, if there's anything you don't understand, anything I move too fast, you talk to me. This is about you, okay? I want this to be beneficial for you. I know you'll probably have semester exams coming up here. Um, I think this is a great review for you right here. That's what I'll tell my students. We have our prep session next Saturday. So then this is, this is going to be your review, what we do next Saturday. So hopefully this is going to help you get prepared. So if there's anything we do today you don't understand, I move too fast, anything like that, you tell me, raise your hand, tell me to do it again, and I'll be glad to do that. A little bit about myself. I, I coach football. I'm head football coach at Madison County High School. I also coach softball there. Um, so I'm involved in a lot of things, as I know you guys are as well. Probably got a lot of different things going on with you. So I know that AP Calculus is a tough course, first of all. So I commend you for getting in there and, and trying to, to hopefully get college-level credit. It's what we're trying to do at the end of this course. Even if you don't pass the AP exam, I promise you, you're going to be better off than not taking AP Cal your senior year. You're going to be better prepared going into college next year, regardless if you receive a qualifying score or not. So I hope that um, you know. I hope that you don't have to retake Cal one, right? but if you do, you're going to be thankful that you did next year. You may not be doing so right now. Any of you not seniors in here? We have any juniors? Okay, good. I know there's a couple there, guys. So you got a couple years, but you'll be thankful as well. So we got. Decatur and West Limestone here, is that correct? So how many folks are from Decatur here? Okay, we're kind of segregated here. You guys over here at West Limestone. Y'all beat us in the first round of the playoffs last year. I don't like y'all already, okay? I'm just kidding. All right, got a really good team last year. Like this kid was a super player, so. All right, but anyway. All right, so we'll get started, make the call. Let me just do this real quick, and I'll forget. And I just want you to tell me your name, where you plan on going to school, this, that, and the other. So we'll start right here, bud. Um, Remington, uh, not really sure where I want to go, but <coughs> try and get into the engineering field. Awesome. Go ahead. I'm Keeling and South Alabama. All right, very good. Uh, I'm Nathan, and I'm thinking about going to Okay, all right. Good luck. I'm Malik, and I'm not sure either. <laughs> I got you. I'm sorry. It's getting close, though. I don't know. Gotcha. You got a little bit more time. Okay. Uh, I'm Gabe. I'm going to go to UAH. Okay. Engineering or? Engineering, yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, I'm Gabe. I'm going to go to Alabama. I'll remember y'all. Both Gabe, huh? I'm going to Alabama. All right. Back over here to the West Limestone. Let's start with you, Bob. Okay. Cameron, going, doing what now? Going to UNA. UNA? All right. Very good. All right. Jaden, I'm going to UAH. Jaden, UAH. Engineering? Yes, sir. I'm Cody, and I want to start out at Cal here. <coughs> Very good. I'm Nicholas, and I want to go to UAH. UAH. I'm Austin, and I want to go to UAH. things we'll do. I'm going to kind of run through and just review just a little bit. <coughs> Hopefully this is things that you have already heard. All right, but most of this is going to be where I'm going to ask you to work. We'll call it the answers, go over them, and then we'll work the ones that we need to. All right, just first of all, first thing you probably talked about it in AP Cal this year was dealing with limits. We talk about limits. How do you evaluate a limit? This is our question, this first one up here. What's the first thing we do in evaluating a limit if X is approaching a finite number? This is where you got to talk to me now. What are y'all going to do? How would you evaluate that first example up there? Plug it in. Direct substitution, right? If x is approaching a finite number, and I don't see, I don't want to see that. I don't have one open here yet. First thing we want to try to do is we want to direct substitute. We're going to take whatever x is approaching, and we're going to plug it in and evaluate is what we're going to do. If we get the, a real value, a non-zero value, or, or a, I shouldn't say non-zero, but if we get a, a, true, a true answer, then we are done. Okay, so for instance, in this first example, if we were evaluating the limit of this as x goes to 5, the first thing we do is plug in 5 for x, 
We get 5 squared minus 6, which is 25 minus 6, which gives me 19. I'm done. That's the answer. Let's move on. Okay? Not going to happen a whole lot of times on the AP Cal exam. We wish it would, but that's not going to happen a lot. A lot of times we're going to look at what happens in this second example. First of all, we look at this again. X is approaching a finite number again. It's approaching 2. So the first thing we're going to do is try direct substitution. So if I plug in 2 for X here, I get 2 squared minus 4 over 2 minus 2. That gives me 4 minus 4 over 0, which is 0 over 0. All right, so this is what we were talking about. This, is, this does not give me a, a real value, okay? In my class, I call that the indeterminate form. I don't know if y'all use that terminology or not, but that's, we, we can't determine the limit right now if we get 0 over 0. So what do we do then if we plug in and we get 0 over 0? What's that? Factor. Factor is one thing we can do. Very well, and that's how we learned it at the beginning of the year. What we try to do is we try to factor the numerator. What will that numerator factor to? x minus 2 times x plus 2 all over x minus 2. And we try to cancel some factors is what we try to do. I can cancel the x minus 2's there. And now we direct substitute again with that reduced with this reduced function, reduced function, and we get 2 plus 2, which would end up giving me 4 would be our answer. Okay? So that's what we learned when we first evaluated limits at the beginning of the year. But there's even a, a probably, I'm not going to say a better way, but there's another way we can do this now once we learn how to take derivatives. Have you guys talked about L'Hopital's rule? Have y'all discussed that? All right, so what's that? Yeah, like pronounce it. Yeah, well, I'm not even sure I pronounce it correctly. So, I know it, I know how to do it though, and I know how to spell. All right. So, what do we do? When do we use L'Hopital's rule? When we try direct substitution and we get zero over zero, what that's screaming to me now is I want to use L'Hopital's rule. Okay. And L'Hopital's rule says this: if I try direct substitution and I get zero over zero. L'Hopital's rule says take the derivative of the numerator and denominator and try to plug in again. So if I go through right here and I take the derivative of the numerator, what's the derivative of x squared minus 4? 2x. 2x. And what's going to be the derivative of the denominator here? It'll be 1. And now we just plug in again. We get 2 times 2 over 1, which is just going to be 4, which is the exact same answer we got just a moment ago using the factoring method. Okay? So we're going to work several examples today where it's going to be much easier to use L'Hopital's rule than it is to try to factor. Some of these you're not even going to be able to factor. So just my, my students sometimes struggle with this. When do we use L'Hopital's rule? When we get this indeterminate form, that's what we're going to try to use L'Hopital's rule. Okay? And then we're about, oh, let's do part C here as well, and then we'll look at a couple others and we're going to work some examples. All right, what about this? We try to evaluate this limit. Once again, X is approaching a finite number here. It's approaching 2. So we're going to try to do what we said we do, direct substitute. And we end up getting 1 over 0 is what we get when we plug in. What does that tell us? That's not 0 over 0, is it? That's 1 over 0. What's this telling me? <coughs> Undefined. Very good. All right, so right here, this is telling me that the limit does not exist is what that's telling me. When we try, to, when I plug in 2 and I get a non-zero value over 0, that tells me I've got a vertical asymptote at x equals 2, okay? So if I've got a vertical asymptote there, I know the limit is not going to exist at that value of 2. So we know, need to know this. What about if I would have gotten 0 over 1? What's the answer to that going to be? 0, okay? 0 over 0, we said that's the indeterminate form. We've got to do some work there. And then if we get 1 over 0, that's going to tell me it does not exist, is what that's going to tell me. Okay, so some of my students get that confused. 0 over a number is just 0. All right, and then let's look at a couple others here. Let's look at this, and then I'm going to ask you to work some questions. What about if x is not approaching a finite number? What about if x is going to positive or negative infinity like we have in this first example? How do we evaluate this if x is going to infinity? Okay, look at the exponents. And I'm, 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 I'm corny, I guess. I give my students little acronyms. We talk about Botu, Betsy, and Bobo. You ever heard of that? Yeah. Okay, good. Y'all got some corny folks too. Okay. All right, so what's Botu mean? Bigger on top. Bigger on top, undefined. 
Betsy, B-E-T-C, means bottom equals top coefficients. And then Bobo, bigger on bottom, zero. Okay? So in this example here, this is going to be an example of where we, what acronyms this is going to be? Betsy. The highest degree term in the numerator is three. Highest degree term in the denominator is three. All this other stuff I don't care about when I'm finding the limit as x goes to positive or negative infinity. So we now look at their coefficients. What's the coefficient of that highest power term? Two. What's the coefficient of this one? It's seven. And then I always encourage my students to check the sign. Okay? If x is going to positive infinity, what's this term right there going to be? Positive or negative? It's going to be positive. What's it going to be if x is going to positive infinity in this term? It would be positive. So in that case, it would be positive 2 over 7 is what it would be. Now, what did we just, when we evaluate the limit as x goes to infinity, what are we really finding? <coughs> huh? In behavior, exactly right, which is also another name for horizontal asymptotes, okay? So what we really have found is that we have a horizontal asymptote right here at y equals 2 over 7 is what we have, okay? So it's just a quick little review of working with limits. I've got a bunch of things there we can do. <coughs> but let's get off of that right now. And what I want you to do is go ahead and open your packet right now. And let's see about doing this first page in our packet of the multiple choice questions. See about doing the first three on your first page. <clears throat> All right. If you will, hold your... Let me get it set up here. I thought I had it set up. Hold, hold up your clicker. Let's see, I always can't remember if it's this. So what what did you think the correct answer was? Uh, a. Okay, just want to make sure I'm reading it right. What about you guys? I'll give me an answer there. Hold it up. Be proud of it. You gotta take a guess. Your answer's something to let on the top. Yeah, the one on the top. Hold it up good guys so I can see it there. Alright, so we're all over the place here. Alright, so let's look at it. Alright. Says the graph of the function f is shown above, if the limit of f of x as x approaches b exists, and f is not continuous at b, then b equals what? We didn't review continuity just a minute ago, but what is continuity? If a function is going to be continuous, what does that mean? There's a three-part definition of continuity that really we have to know for the AP exam. One, if it's going to be continuous, is what's one of the conditions? Do I know? Limit has to exist. Very good. The limit has to exist. All right. Number two, what's the second thing? B has to exist. Very good. The function has to exist. And then the third part of it is those two have to be equal to one another. So in this particular case, if we look up here, first of all, just tell me where is this function that I'm looking at right here? Where is it discontinuous at? At what x values would you tell me it's discontinuous? X equals zero. X equals zero. Why is it discontinuous at x equals zero? What's wrong with that? Does the limit exist at x equals zero? Yes, it does. Does the function exist at x equals 0? Yes. yes. But are those two equal to one another? They are not. Therefore, that's why it's discontinuous there. How about where's the next place it's discontinuous? At x equals 2, right? Why is it discontinuous at 2? Does the limit exist? No. no. Remember, in order for the limit to exist, all that has to be true is that as we approach the value from the left and as we approach from the right, they have to be approaching, have to be approaching the same value. In that case, there's not. What's the left-hand limit going to be as x approaches 2? What would the left-hand limit be? 2. two. What would the right-hand limit be? One. 1. So saying all that, can we answer the question now? The graph of the function shown above, if the limit exists and f is not continuous at b, then b equals what? Well, I think we just answered that question. Which of these correct answers, which of these is going to be correct? B. At b. At b, did we say, does the limit exist at, at 0? Yes, we said that it does, but is the function continuous at zero? No, it's not. All right, so the correct answer there should have been B is what we should have had. All right, everybody follow that? And once again, if you don't, you say, no, I don't get it. And I'll go over it again and hopefully give you a better explanation than what I did the first time. All right, number two. What would you get for number two? We'll just 
One, two, three, four, or five. We'll just go with hands right here. One's A, two's B, three C, four D, five E. Just hold up your numbers. Okay, see lots of threes and lots of threes are correct. All right, three is correct. It says the graph of the function shown above, which the following statements is false. If we go down to C, does the limit of this function exist at x equal four? No. What's the left-hand limit going to be? About 1.9 or something. What's the right-hand limit going to be as we approach 4? Would be 4. Okay? And then the last one there on that page, number 3, we just talked a little bit about horizontal asymptotes, and this was a little bit tricky to me the first time I worked it. What's the correct answer on number 3? 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5? Okay, you don't see many folks with a, with a finger up right here. Okay? But the correct answer here is going to be this guy, all right? Number five is what our letter E is what it's going to be. All right, let's talk about why that is. Why is that the correct answer? Well, if we look at this again, we just talked about horizontal asymptotes. When I ask you about horizontal asymptotes, or when the AP folks ask you about horizontal asymptotes, they are really asking you to find the limit as x goes to positive and negative infinity is another way to ask that question. So we're thinking our acronyms, Betsy, Botu, and Bobo is what we're thinking. All right, so when we look at this, you know, y equal 5, we're looking for one of these functions who have the same degree in the numerator and denominator, okay? And the only one of these here that even could remotely come close, this one does. That's a degree of 1, degree of 1, so that's a possibility. And this one here is as well, all right? 20 over 4 is, is going to reduce to 5, so that's a possibility. So really, we could eliminate these other three here rather quickly, okay? So is it D or E? How are we going to figure that out? Well, this is what I talked about just a moment ago. We want to be careful with our signs. As X goes, if I was to evaluate letter D, if we looked at this as X goes to infinity, what would be the answer to this guy right here as X goes to infinity? It would be negative 5, wouldn't it? Because the 5 in the numerator is positive. The, what's the coefficient down here? It's a negative 1 or just a 1. But if x is going to positive infinity, the way I think about it, this would be a positive value. This is going to be negative. So really, that's negative 5 is what that would be. But this one here, 20 over 4, will reduce to 5. That's the correct answer. Excuse me, guys. Mm, goodness. All right, questions on the first three. <coughs> now, I realize that all those answer choices there have five answer choices. What's the AP exam now? How many answer choices are you going to have for each multiple choice question? Four. There's only four now. That changed last year. Okay, I think it's important that you know a little bit about the AP exam. How many multiple choice questions are there on the AP exam without the calculator? Do you know that? 25. You have 25 multiple choice questions where you're not going to have a calculator and you get 50 minutes to do them. So you're smart folks. How many, on average, how much time should you spend on one multiple choice question? About two minutes. Now, some of them are going to take 10 seconds, some of them may take four minutes, but on average, we should be spending about two. All right, let's do a couple of these. We're not going to do every single one of them here, but on the next page, let's do five and six. Do five and six. Six. This is one of those where signs important here, and this one we'll talk a little bit more about it. But what's the correct answer for number six? Okay, very good. See lots of these again as well. B is the correct answer. All right, very good. Any of those two you want to go over? Yeah, number six. Okay, good. I want to go over number six anyway because I'm going to change that question up just a little bit. All right, so here's our question. First thing I see is x is approaching positive or negative infinity. Okay. So that's where we're thinking acronyms. I get frustrated with some of my students at times where we're evaluating the limit as x is approaching 2, and they'll tell me that it's, you know, they'll tell me the answer is 0 because of Bobo or something like that. We only use those acronyms when x is approaching positive or negative infinity. So we look at this, and we're trying to see degrees of the numerator and denominator. 
So you've got to be a little careful here with this one now. What's the highest degree term in the numerator going to be? Well, we're taking the square root of x to the fourth. The square root of x to the fourth was going to be x squared, right? So that's x squared. And then this down here is x squared as well. So this is another example where this is bottom equals top. So we're going to look at the coefficients. Now, this top coefficient is not 9. It's the square root of 9, isn't it? So it really is going to be 3. And then the coefficient for this one there is 1. So we're thinking 3 over 1, which is 3, is what we're thinking is the answer. But I always want my students to check the sign. Let's make sure. As x goes to positive infinity, what's this term here going to be, positive or negative? It's going to be positive. If we raise it to the fourth power, it's positive. What's this term going to be? If we square something, it's going to be positive. So it's positive, positive. So it's positive 3 would be our answer, which is b. What would the limit have been if x was going to negative infinity? Think about that just a second. What would the limit of this function have been if x was going to negative infinity? How would we have gotten that answer? Same process, right? Everything we would have done would have been pretty much the same. But what would it, is the same answer? Is it going to be positive 5? Well, actually it is. I wasn't thinking here. But it would be the same answer, right? Because when we plug in the negative here, when we raise that to the fourth power, what's that going to be? Still positive. What's, when we square that, what's it still going to be? Still going to be positive. So that would be an example of where still where it's going to be positive 3. So that answer there would still be B in both situations. Okay? Questions on 5 or 6? All right, guys. I want y'all talking to me now. All right. Let's look at this. We talked a little bit about continuity here. Let's look at questions 7 and 8 right now. See if we can answer those. Questions 7 and 8, dealing with a little bit of continuity. What's the correct answer for 7? Give me numbers. Okay. Hopefully I see lots of 3's, right? It's asking us where are we discontinuous here in this. So tell me where are we discontinuous. When we look at this, what's the first x value we're discontinuous at? Negative 1. Why negative 1? Very good. F of negative 1 does not exist. Okay. Where's the next place we're discontinuous? One. X equal 1. Why are we discontinuous at 1? Not the limit doesn't exist, right? The limit does not exist. All right? In this case, F of negative 1 does not exist. And then there's one other place. Where else are we discontinuous? Two. X equal 2. And why are we discontinuous at 2? Because the limit as X approaches 2 does not what? Equal f of 2, okay? And that's really important, guys. I know you're saying, why are you making such a big deal out of this definition? Because I promise you on the AP exam, one of the questions, probably on the free response, is going to ask you to justify is this, is this function continuous or not at x equals whatever. And you've got to know the three-part definition. Three parts. Limit has to exist, function has to exist at the value, and those two have to be equal in order to be continuous, okay? And then number eight, number eight's a little bit challenging here, probably spent most of your time here working on number eight, but it gives us this piecewise function, which the AP exam loves piecewise function. And they're asking here, it says, for what value of k is f going to be <coughs> continuous at two? So talk to me here. What what'd you try to do with this in this question? I looked at several of you working there. Anybody want to share a little bit on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock? Ma'am? Is it E? It is E. Yes, ma'am, it is E. How'd you get E? Uh, canceled out X minus 2 on the top and bottom, leaving 2X plus 1, and then I just substituted in 2. Okay, very good. That's exactly right. All right. What we may have tried to do, you know, and this is kind of a, an odd piecewise function, we'll say, it's defined as this function for all values not equal to 2, and it's defined as K for when the function equals to 2. If I tried to plug in a 2 into that function right now, what would I end up getting? 0 over 0. 0 over 0, which we know is that indeterminate form. 
But what we did, you talked about factoring earlier, if we do exactly what she just told us to do, if we cancel those factors and plug in that 2 now, we get 2 times 2 plus 1 is equal to 5. What that's telling me is that the limit of this function as x approaches 2 is 5. So if we want this function to be continuous at 2, then we know the value of the function at 2 also has to be 5. So you're exactly right there. Uh, letter number 8, E, is going to be 5. Okay? So that's, we hit limits and continuity there in about 30 minutes. Okay? Any questions on limits and continuity? What's it take for a limit? I know we, it's a long, long time ago since we evaluated limits. How do we know if a limit exists or not? What does it take? That's exactly right. Do we care about the value of the function at the x value that's being approached? In a limits concern, we don't, right? We don't even care if the function exists or not at what x is approaching. Just the left hand and the right hand limit have to be the same. I always talk to my students about roads and bridges. In order for a limit to exist, the roads just have to come to the same point. Doesn't matter if the bridge is built there or not. Now, to be continuous, the roads have to come together and the bridge has to be there in order to be continuous, okay? So I know my students sometimes struggle with that limit part of it when we get into, because it's just been so long since we've worked with it. All right, so then the next part of this, and this is where we're going to spend quite a bit of this here, is dealing with derivatives, okay? I'm not going to review all your derivative rules with you. I want to see what you know, all right? So let's flip over in your packet several pages. I think it's page number... Uh, 14. You flip over to page 14 right now, and I want you to write down the derivative of those 14 functions right now. Let's see what you remember. Functions f and g, but this is something that you will see on the AP exam. The AP exam, you need to be able to work with these. So the derivative of 2 times f of x is just going to be 2 times the derivative of f of x, which is f prime of x. So all that we would write there. It's just our constant multiple rules, what we talked about. What rule is this? Product. Product. So it's just the derivative of first. It doesn't matter the order here. So it would be f prime of x times g of x plus f of x times g prime of x. Order there is not important. Derivative of one times the other plus derivative of the other times the other. Okay? Number three, what rule? Quotient. Y'all probably got a little way of remembering quotient. What do you remember? Low D high minus high D low, low low. Is that what y'all remember? Okay, so the way I do it as well. So low D high, low D high minus high D low, low low. Okay, all over low low is the way we remember that. So that's quotient rule. All right, four looks a little awkward. F of G of X. All right, so what is... What's that asking us? What rule is that testing us on? Chain. Chain, okay? So it's just going to be, when we think about, you know, this is f of whatever, you know, whatever you want to write there. The derivative of f of whatever is just going to be f prime of whatever's there, which in this case would be g of x. And then we have to remember to go back and multiply times the derivative of whatever's inside, which is g prime of x is the way we would write that. So that would be chain rule. One of the most common mistakes on the AP exam is not using chain rule correctly. You've got to know chain rule. Derivative of e to the u is what? E to the u times the derivative. E to the u times the derivative of u, which is u prime. Okay. I know well, some of us get a little trouble with that. But what's the derivative of e to the x? E to the x. E to the x, because the derivative of x is 1. What would be the derivative of e to the 2x? 2. E to the 2x times 2 which will be 2e to the 2x. Very good. How about 6? Natural log of u. 1 over u times the derivative. Okay, that's fine. You can say it that way, or I just remember that as it's just u prime over u. Derivative of whatever that is all over whatever that is. We're taking the natural log of whatever. It's derivative of whatever over whatever. And then our trig, got to know the derivative of cosine is? Negative sine. Negative sine. Negative sine. Derivative of cotangent? Cosine squared. Negative cosecant squared x. If you're taking the derivative of any of the trig functions that begin with the letter c, the derivative is always going to be a negative something. Okay? Alright, number, so let me scroll down here just a little bit. Number nine. Alright? Derivative of cosecant x is going to be what? Negative cosecant. 
Very good. Negative cosecant x, cotangent x, greater than sine x, cosine x, tan x. Secant squared. Very good. Secant x. Secant tangent. Very good. Secant x, tan x. So we need to know those. And then the derivative of 1 over x, and it looks a little awkward here, I'm not sure exactly why they throw this in here, but it's something that we probably take the derivative of quite a bit. I hope that most of you would say this is just the same as saying the derivative of x to the negative 1 power, right? And we just use our basic power rules, all that we're going to do, so it would be what? Negative, negative x to the negative 2, which we would probably want to rewrite that as negative 1 over x squared. Right? That's the derivative. And really what, what, what we're trying to get you to do there is that we're going to take the derivative of 1 over x quite a bit. So it would be nice if you just remembered the derivative of 1 over x is negative 1 over x squared. If you just could put that in your memory, that would be great. Now let's talk just a minute about simplification and so forth. Two parts of the exam. Multiple choice, free response. Multiple choice, you're going to have to get your answer to match one of the multiple choice response, uh, one, of the, one of the multiple choice answers. So you're probably going to have to be able to factor, reduce, simplify, and get your answer to look like whatever they've got there. Free response, do we need to reduce on the free response? Absolutely not. On the free response, you don't waste time reducing your answers. If I get negative x to the negative 2, then I'm going to leave it just like that. Don't waste time simplifying on the free response. If I get here and I made a mistake going here, I'm going to lose a point, okay? So, and plus, time's going to be an issue. So, on the free response, don't you worry about uh, simplifying. And then this guy here, 14, you know, really we can use our power rule here again as well. But I hope that you will remember this. We'll take the derivative of this quite a bit. What's the derivative of root x? 1 over 2 root x. 1 over 2 root x. And really, you just need to remember that. If you can't, then you can certainly use the power rule. That's just asking you to take the derivative of x to the half power, which would be 1 half x to the negative a half power, which we would write as 1 over 2 root x is how we would write that. It would be beneficial for you to remember that. All right, so that's just a quick little review of derivatives. I know you've been taking derivatives, it seems like, forever now. Every question we do, and I tell my students all the time as we get closer to the exam, I don't care. If you don't know what to do, what are you going to do? Take the derivative. If you know nothing else to do, take the derivative of the function. You may get a point on a free response. So. Most of the questions we're going to work, you're going to be taking a derivative. All right, so let's do a couple of these derivatives. Once you do number 9, 10, 11, and 12. 9, 10, 11, and 12. Go back to e, 11b, and 12e. Okay? I know I was looking at quite a few of your guys do number 11, so quite a few of you missing that. But what about 9 or 10? Anybody want to look at 9 or 10? Everybody got 9 and 10? Is that what you're telling me? Okay. All right. I'll be honest with you. When I was preparing for this, when I worked number 9 the first time, I missed it. Okay? Because I didn't see that. I didn't see the ln of x right there is what I didn't see. So be careful. Don't you look at something like this, and this is kind of like what I like. Any of you fish? Kind of. This is what I call, this is brim. You know where the brim are. we got to go catch brim. All right? This is a, we can't miss this question. But I missed it the first time I was working it because... I looked at that and I didn't see that. So I just took the derivative of 7 is what I did and I put D as my answer. So be careful, be 7 plus 1 over x, right? And then we take the derivative at 1 and we get 7 plus 1 over 1, which is going to be 8. That's how we get E. So don't miss the easy ones. That's the big deal. All right, what rule do we have to use for number 10? Product. Product. I had to use product there to do that. Now, I know I want to look at number 11. I was kind of watching most of you work number 11, see what you did here on number 11. What rule are, is this testing us on here on question 11? Change. This is chain, okay? And any time I have a trig function raised to a power like I do here, I encourage my students to rewrite it like this. I'm going to put brackets around the whole thing. I'm going to call this sine of 3 minus x, all of that to the second power. I think you're more likely to see that this is chain rule, okay? And I saw quite a few of you as I was working this, all I saw was like negative 2 cosine 3 minus x was your derivative, okay? And you didn't use the chain rule the correct number of times. So when I take the derivative of this, it's going to be, and here's the way I, I think about this, and I use all kinds of words in here, but this is just something to the second power, whatever you want to call it. The derivative of something to the second power is going to be 2, 
times that something to the first power times the derivative of that something. So I still now have to take the derivative of what I've colored in pink there. So what's now going to be the derivative of sine 3 minus x? Well, i got to use chain rule again, don't I? What's the derivative of sine times the quantity 3 minus x going to be? Well, it's going to be cosine of 3 minus x <coughs> times the derivative of what's inside there, which is going to be what? Negative 1. Okay, y'all follow how I got that. That's chain rule twice is what that is. And now we're just wanting to know the value of the derivative at zero is what we're wanting to do. All right, so now we're just going to clean this up a little bit. I'm going to pull this negative in front. So we'll get a negative two, sine, plug in a zero for x. This will just be sine of three times the cosine of three. And hopefully that's, we said the correct choice was B is what we should have. Okay. Challenge. You can do that question, you understand chain rule, okay? Because that's, that's certainly heavy chain rule. And then number 12 there, I don't know if I called the correct answer out, so I looked at several of you do that as well. That's E, that's what we should have there. And for some reason, I did a better job on that one than you did on 11. Anybody want to look at number 12? Okay. All right, if we look at 12 here, all right, once again, we've got some function raised to the fifth power is what we have. So once again, I see that as something to the fifth power. You know, I know we can't have colored pencils and all that on the AP exam, but here I have something to the fifth power. So the derivative of something to the fifth power is going to be 5 times something to the fourth power times the derivative of that something. So I've got to take the derivative of the inside now is what I have to do. So what's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared, and the derivative of negative cos or cosine x is going to be what? Negative sine x, but we got the negative there in front of it, so really it's going to make that a plus sine of x, and really that's all there will be to that. Hopefully we look over here for the correct choice. Be careful, they all kind of look alike, don't they, to be honest with you. Make sure we choose the right one, and hopefully we get E there is what we would get. that make sense? All right. Um, all right, let's, we're going to kind of move on here just a little bit. Work a couple of others here. We've got about 20 minutes, and we'll try to finish a couple things up. Uh, we'll try to do number 15 right now. You've got to get, how many of you have graphing calculators? Okay. Need your graphing calculator to do number 15. All right, so we've got to be able to use our graphing calculators. Now, as we talked about, as you're getting your calculators out there, there are two parts to the multiple choice part on the AP exam, right? Part one, you're going to have no calculator, 25 questions, 50 minutes. Part two, the multiple choice, you're going to have 15 questions and 45 minutes, and you will have a calculator, okay? So really, you average about three minutes a question on this. So see what you can do. This is, some of you just get... Scared just by looking at this one here. All right, but let's see. You've got your calculator. Let's see what we can do. function, A to T, gives me the temperature of the water in a pond is all that's telling me. Or T is the number of days since January 1. T equals zero. What's the IROC, instantaneous rate of change of the temperature of the water at time T equal 90? So all that boils down to what? What's this question asking me to do? Find the derivative of H of T and evaluate it where? At 90. That's exactly what it's asking me to do. Can your calculator, does it have the capabilities of doing that for you? Yep. Sure it does. Now, you've got to be careful. If you miss this question, it may be because you didn't enter the function. That's not an easy function to enter in, okay? Now, do all of you have the new operating systems on your calculator where you can enter fractions like this? If you don't, I strongly suggest that you get that because if, when I enter this in, I know right now 
it's going to look exactly like that function that I have right there. So that looks exactly like what I've listed there, and I just want to evaluate the derivative of that function at 90. So the way that I would do it, and there's multiple ways you can do this, I would go to my home screen, you could graph it and do it from there, I, I would not do that. I go math 8, we want to take the derivative. I want to take the derivative of what I've entered for y1. Okay, I don't want to enter that function again, I've already entered it for y1. Y'all know how to use your bars button? Y'all not familiar with that? If I hit bars, V-A-R-S, and move it over to the right to y bars, and then hit function, and then hit 1, y1, what I'm saying there is I'm taking the derivative of y1. Whatever function I entered in for y1, that's where I'm taking the derivative of it. That keeps me from having to rewrite all that crap. And then I want to take the derivative and evaluate it at where? At 90 in this case is what we want to do. Let's make sure I'm in the right mode. I should be, but let's just double check. What mode shall we be in? Radian. Radian, and I am in radians. So we get 0 0.153 degrees Fahrenheit a day. So 15 should hopefully be B is what it would be. Any questions on how I did that? Y'all, Are y'all familiar with the shortcuts on your calculator and using the bars button at all? Okay. You should be able to hit alpha F4 also. Alpha F4, okay, all right. Very, how about that? That's even better. I right, I learned something new, thank you, okay. Alpha F4 pulls, up, pulls it up pretty quickly as well. Okay, Y1, very good, thank you, I appreciate that. All right, so, all right, try 16 right now. You learned how to take the derivative. Limit definition. Limit definition, and we hated it, didn't we, okay? And once we learned our shortcuts for derivatives, guess what, we was like, man, I ain't ever using that limit definition again to take a derivative. Well, I'm with you, okay? But they're going to ask a question on the AP exam that's going to look like this, okay? So you're going to have to at least understand that limit definition of a derivative. Do you recall what it said? It was the limit as h approaches 0 of what? f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, okay? So when we look at this expression that I'm given, this limit here that I'm given, if we can identify what f of x is, we still can use our shortcut rules. We don't have to go through and use this limit definition method. So from looking at that, what do you think f of x is going to be? What is f of x? If this is my limit, what is f of x going to be? Four. Okay, and that's the common mistake we want to make. It's not the natural log of 4, but it's going to be the natural log of x is what it's going to be. And I'll tell you why. If it was the natural log of 4, then these two, this and this, would be the same because that x plus h would have no effect if our function was just ln of 4. So it's got to be ln of x because when I plug in 4 plus h, I've got to have that plus h. If it was just ln of 4, this and this would be the same. Okay, so there's an x in here is what we have there. So our function here is ln of x, and what we're really asking us to do, this expression is really asking us to find the derivative at 4 is really what it's asking us to do, okay? So, what's the derivative of ln of x going to be? What did we just say just a moment ago? Come on, what's the derivative of ln of x? 1 over x. And if we want to evaluate it at 4, what are we going to get? 1 over 4, b would be our correct choice. All right, so we've got to at least be familiar with the limit definition of the derivative. don't have to use it, okay, but we've got to be familiar with it in order to be able to do it, okay? All right, a couple others here real quick, and then we'll run out of time. All right, try number 19 for me. Sudden sharp turn. Do I have a cusp up here in this graph? Yeah, where do we have a cusp at? X equal 1. It's not going to be differentiable at x equal 1. We have that sudden sharp turn. 
Some people call it a corner, lots of different ways, but we call it a cusp. Where else is a function not differentiable at? Vertical. Okay, be careful, not vertical. Vertical, vertical tangent line, right? Very good. At vertical tangent lines, such as right here at x equal negative 2, it tells me right there at x equal negative 2, we have a vertical tangent line. So that's another place that this function is going to be discontinuous. And where else is a function discontinuous? A corner, to me, a corner and a cusp are the same thing. There's one other place. Cusp, vertical tangent lines, and if the function is not continuous, then we can't be differentiable as well. So at x equals 0 is also going to be a place. All right? Now, what, what's going on here? What are all the values for which f, okay, all right, for which f is continuous but not differentiable, okay? So the reason that x equals 0 is not included in this answer is what? It's not continuous. It's not continuous. So we're looking for the values for which f is continuous but not differentiable. It's continuous there, it's just not differentiable because we have that vertical tangent line. What's the slope of vertical lines? Undefined. That's why it's undefined. All right, Because when we take derivatives, we're finding the slope of the tangent line. And then the other place we talked about was x equals 1, and we know that that's not because we have a cusp. Okay, questions on that? So you've got to know what it means to be differentiable. All right, I want you to try to do number 21 right now. We'll hit a couple of these. We've just got a couple minutes trying to hit each one. 21, remember what we talked about at the beginning of class. Some kind of little funny rule here we should know that helps us evaluate limits. What's the first thing we did with this limit question? We talked about that at the beginning. Direct substitution, right? We plugged in 0 for x. That's hopefully what we all try to do. What did we get when we plugged in 0 for x? We got 0 minus the sine of 0, which is 0, all over 0 plus the sine of 0, which is 0. We got indeterminate form, okay? So then you're like, okay, then what do we do? Well, some of we talked about factoring earlier. I think I can factor that, can y'all? So what do we do then if we can't factor? Well, what do we say? L'Hopital's rule, okay? And what's L'Hopital's rule say we do? Take the derivative of both the top and bottom. Very good. Take the derivative of the top, which in this case would be 7 minus cosine x. Take the derivative of the bottom, as you said, which would be 2x plus, what's the derivative of sine 3x? 3 cosine 3x. 3 cosine 3x, very good. And then we try to <laughs> substitute again. We get 7 minus the cosine of 0. What's the cosine of 0? 1. All over 0 plus 3 times the cosine of 0, which is 3 times 1, which is 3. So we get 6 over 3, which ends up giving me 2, would be the correct answer. Okay. So L'Hopital's rule certainly about the only way really we can do that in that particular question. All right. Now, let's look at 22 together, and then we'll be ready for a break, I guess. We didn't get to a free response. We may try to come back and hit it if we can. PVA. All right, what's PVA stand for? Any idea? Position, velocity, acceleration. There you go. All right, PVA, position, velocity, acceleration. You're going to see that a lot of different ways, and really that ties into what we're going to be talking about in the next session, F, F prime, and F double prime. How, what's the relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration? If I give you the position function, how do you get velocity? Derivative. Take the derivative. How do you get acceleration? Derivative, derivative of velocity or it's the derivative. second derivative of position. Okay? So we've got to know how to work with that. So in this question, it says for time t greater than zero, the velocity of the particle is given here. At what values of t is the acceleration of the particle equal to zero? So what are we going to have to do to answer that question? You've got to take the derivative of the velocity function, right? So see if you can do that right now. See if you can take the derivative of the velocity function. What rule are we going to use here to take the derivative of that velocity function? Product. Product, all right? So see if you can do that. Last question, then we're taking a break, guys. We'll get your break here. All right, so hopefully this is what you got. Once you took the derivative of the velocity, we got the acceleration function using product rule. Now, what did you do? What do we want to do? At what values of t is the acceleration of the particle equal to zero? Is this asking me to, to tell you the acceleration at zero? 
No, it's asking us to tell at what time is the acceleration equal to zero. So what do I need to do with this right here? Set it, Set it equal to zero. Now, algebra sometimes gets in our way in calculus here. What would you do with this? How would you solve this? What would you do? Just quit and say algebra whoop me. Well, I always encourage my students to factor. What, are both, what does this term and this term contain? A t minus 2. So I'm going to factor a t minus 2 out of these two terms. What's that leave me with? Well, it leaves me with a 2 and a t minus 5 there. Plus, I'm taking the t minus 2 out. It's going to leave me with just one t minus 2 there. Now, once I do that, all right, I can go through and simplify this. I'm going to speed this up. Once I distribute, I'm going to get 2t plus t, which will give me 3t. And then I get 2t minus, or 2 times negative 5 will be negative 10. And then minus 2, which will give me negative 12. So that's kind of what that reduces to there. And then we would just set each of our factors equal to zero. And this is going to give me the two times at which the acceleration would be equal to zero would be C, 2 and 4. Okay? All right. We'll stop there. I know we didn't get everything worked there. Sorry that, but it's just a lot to cover. They want us to cover today. Hopefully that was beneficial for you in some.